Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Jeremy Frank and this is the first episode of my interview series, which I'll be putting on YouTube with a bunch of people that are in the baseball industry. My first episode comes with a good friend of mine, Devin Fink, who currently is a writer at Fangraphs.com and a student online currently at um, Dartmouth. But Devin, thank you so much for being uh, the first guest. I could not have picked um, a better one. Well, first, appreciate that. Second, the online school, man. Oof, that hits hard. Sucks, yeah. but no, we're all dealing with it right now. So, so, so you're currently a writer at uh, at Fangraphs.com. So, um, when did you start getting into uh, uh, baseball writing or like sports writing in general? Um, so yeah, I started um, baseball writing when I was in sixth grade. Um, I started my own website called CoverThoseBases.com. It's still up today. Um, kind of as a tribute to my grandfather, he passed away that year. Um, he and I would always talk about baseball. And um, when he when he passed, you know, my mom basically handed me a journal. She's like, you know, you can write in this journal as a way to keep talking to him. But, you know, I was like, this is, I don't know, I just didn't really see, a, I didn't really see the benefit of that. But I kind of took that idea and, and made a blog and started blogging about uh, baseball to kind of keep in touch with him. And then Slowly but surely, like, I gained a small following on Twitter, and um, that's kind of, it's kind of incredible that people wanted to read some, like, 11-year-old's work about baseball, here's thoughts, but um, through Twitter, he met some cool people and, you know, kind of started from there. So, I know it's hard to sometimes point to, like, a, like a specific moment where, like, it really took off. Like, I know, like, for me it's kind of hard to like see like, oh, like how did this all happen? But like if you had to point to like a couple things in your along the road from cover those bases to where you are at Fangraphs, like where did it first like start that like this is like for real like a thing? Um, I think there, there was a couple things. I um, Well, when I first started, I thought I wanted to be a baseball journalist or a broadcaster or a reporter. So I kind of, I, I kind of just, got ahead of myself a little bit and started contacting people in the baseball industry being like, Hey, like I'm a baseball reporter, um, you know, any tips or anything that you could give me. And then started kind of becoming close with a couple of people in the industry. Um, and so when I was in eighth grade, actually, um, I broke the Billy Butler signing, um, with the Oakland athletics. And that was kind of a big break for me. Um, it, I got kind of lucky with, got a tip, got tweeted it out. There's kind of a, it's kind of a pretty crazy week um, when that, when that went down. But yeah, I mean, that was kind of, I look at that as kind of like my big break. Um, and then since then, I think that really put me on the map a little bit more, I would say, as far as being a legit baseball writer. Um, but then I think in the time since I've transitioned more to baseball analysis than baseball reporting, I don't really try to break news that much anymore. And I would say that's kind of been a steady progression. Um, I mean, when I got the job at Fangraphs, that also was a pretty, pretty big milestone. And there were other things along the way. Um, some of them, I just kind of, there wasn't any stroke of luck. Like, what? well, I mean, I guess you could say it was lucky that the winter meetings happened to be held in D.C. Like for the first time, in like 70 years when I was a sophomore in high school. Um, so I went um, and I got to meet a lot of the connections I had made and got to continue to network. So things like that um, really helped knowing people in the industry and um, getting the job at fan graphs and breaking the story, you know, those, those three, those three things when like put together, I think is a good um, way to just kind of summarize how I progressed. So I know people that have followed you recently, which I think is the majority of your following has started in the last, like following you in the last couple of years. Cause I know you've yeah. Twitter growth is pretty exponential. I know it's been like that for you. So I know a lot of people don't like remember, I didn't even follow you back then when you were, breaking news on the regular or like rather to like now where I feel like you're more of like an analysis like you write for Fangraphs it's a very uh baseball heavy like analysis website so like when did that shift like happen and like why did you make that change if you wanted to be a sports writer a few like when you first started um it's it's kind of funny because yeah so I I originally started off trying to break news um and I and I like how you characterized it as regularly because that's probably a little bit better and how often I was breaking news. <laughs> um, I mean, I did have a couple of scoops beyond Billy Butler here and there, but uh, nothing nearly as impactful. Um, and that one was was pretty crazy. There, there was a week where it was just like, 
I I thought I was like famous. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's pretty cool. You got um Ken Rosenthal to credit you uh, on MLB Network. I'll link yeah, that because yeah. I think and it's he, a funny and, thing. And he interviewed me, and it, it was it was a fun time. But um, you got you, you know, got I, out of school for that, right? When you were yeah. Like, so grade? yeah. So the story about that is um, yeah. So one day um, the MLB Network like producer sent me an email. I mean, we'd been in touch because they had found out that um, I, you know, assisted in breaking this story and whatnot. And they were like, yeah, so we want you on at 11 a.m. tomorrow to interview and talk about your scoop. And I was like, I'm going to be in English. So my mom signed me out of school for a few minutes. We drove over mom. to the school parking lot and I took my call from MLB Network from there. And, you know, it's something I'll like never forget. And that whole week, I mean, it was, it was a lot of you know, a, a lot of different media organizations. It's really interesting to see. I wouldn't even say it went viral, but it's really interesting to see different news outlets pick up on other things. Because um, obviously, if MLB Network had never put out that, you know, a 13-year-old had just scooped, you know, all these reporters, I don't think any other media organization would have picked up on it. But it was a really fun week, but I wouldn't even characterize that as, like, me anymore. I, 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 mean, that, I mean, yes, it's definitely part of it. But after a while, I mean... Chasing scoops and everything. First, there's like a couple of reasons why you know that you're, n- you're not going to get a whole lot of out of it. One, it's just all about who's being first. And like, you know, there's a million different ways to break down the Garrett Cole to the Yankees, but only one person's first. And like, no one remembers who's first. Right. But maybe if, if someone talks about how that contract is characterized in all of the different large 300 plus million dollar deals. That stuff is more interesting. That stuff, there's more meat on that bone versus being first. And then second, after a while, you just have to realize that like beyond Kevin Rosenthal, Jeff Passan and John Haven, you're not going to get that many scoops regularly, especially when you're like an independent reporter. I mean, I I was writing for my own blog. You know, I think when you get a sense of how baseball news works, right? A lot of these agents and a lot of these teams like giving scoops to these guys because they have such large readerships like it can right. help boost the profile of their player not saying that garrett cole needs profile boost but maybe if one of those guys gets a scoop they're also going to tweet out about that same agent uh, you know one of his lesser players who is getting a workout or something you know keep those guys in the news uh, that's kind of how i mean that's kind of how I, I see this sort of stuff playing out. And I don't, even still, I really don't have that to offer. I don't have this huge readership. I mean, Ken Rosenthal has over a million followers on Twitter. Like, I'm not going to compete with that. Um, so I think realizing some of that really helped drive that transition. And then also, I just found doing baseball research to be more fun. I remember the first research article I think I ever wrote. It, it was for Cover Those Bases. It was about how pitchers' ERAs could potentially be impacted by their defense. And, like, I looked at what the defensive runs saved um, and then, like, added that back into their ERA. And I did that on a team scale and talked about how team ERAs could look different if their pitchers were worse defenders and stuff like that. Um, so that was, like, the first thing I did. And then I kind of got hooked on that a little bit um, and then started working up on the box score and then eventually a fan grass. I know this is a really long answer to your question, but. No, the longer, the more in-depth answers, the better. This is what we're, this is what we're here for. But um, if you um, so when did you when did you get the blue check mark? I know a lot of people uh, a lot of people make fun of me because uh, you do have the blue check mark and and I don't. So that was that when you were more of a like a reporter, or was that when you uh, more recently? Um, well, first, Jeremy, I mean, I, I know we we like to talk about it, but your blue check mark is coming. It's long, <laughs> long past deserved. Yeah, you, you deserved that oh, a long time what, ago. What's the secret? You're, you wrote an author. How do I get You're it? You're an author. Um, so, with you, Evan. <laughs> so it's it's an interesting story because I was a sophomore in high school and that was the short amount of time where Twitter allowed you to apply for verification. But it but it was really bizarre because I did apply and then they sent me an email. They're like, yeah, you're not verifiable. And you're not, you're not, you don't have the stature to be verified. Like your Yikes. account just isn't, isn't that. I mean, it wasn't that harsh, but that's kind of what it was saying. And I just kind of was like, all right, yeah, that's fair. And I went along my day. And then like, a few months later, I got an email from Twitter. It's like, we want to verify your account. So, like, I don't know if it was me submitting that request or right. then, or, like, maybe it put them on their radar and then they, like, tracked it for a while. Like, that's possible. I don't really know how it works. Um, you were, but, like, a top prospect, and then you finally, like, did one more thing, and you're like, wow, there we I go. I got the promotion. The um, yeah, so I don't really know whether it was the 
the application or not, but that's kind of what ended up happening. Um, and um, yeah, so they sent me an email. They're like, we want to verify your account. They needed some I ID from me. Um, I didn't have a driver's license at the time, so yeah. or a learner's permit. So I had to, I had to improvise a little bit. But Did you go with a birth women, certificate or what? Um, I think passport? so. How it ended up working out was Twitter said that they would accept a passport, but they they only needed certain information. So they didn't. So they didn't need your entire passport picture page, right. which like, obviously I didn't want to scan in my passport picture page and like email it to Twitter because like, what if it was fake? So I took pieces of paper and covered up everything they said that they didn't need. I like and, it. And, and I got that. Um, I got my parents to agree to that. They're like, I'm like, look, it can't be used because all of it, half of the picture page is covered up. It's just like my name and my picture. And, and that's pretty much it. That's proof that it is a passport. And then, I sent that in and then the next day I remember I was sitting in space because you remember these things because like you're just like shocked so like yes, the next day no, sure. the next day I was like sitting in Spanish class and when you're verified the, the, the first thing that happens is the ver the at verified Twitter account follows you so every single every single um like verified Twitter account in in the world is, is followed by that so if you want to see a list in theory of every verified account you just go through the following right. of that at verified handle. But um, so, yeah, so the first thing that happened was they, this account followed me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like this is real. But like the blue check mark didn't like show up until I like, you know, forced closed the app and then opened it back up. And I was like, oh, my God, like I got That's verified. Fair. And yeah, it was like pretty it was pretty cool. Um, I mean, I think a lot of my a lot of my friends think that's like the coolest thing. I, I don't I don't know. I think I've maybe become like a little desensitized to it. Like it's just part of my Twitter account. Yeah, I mean, it I'm is sure cool. most sophomores in high school would be pretty like psyched if one of their classmates got the check mark. Because I'm check they they Twitter I, I was does not just give out check happened. marks to anyone. No, Twitter, I was psyched. It's not like it's not like Instagram where like they just like yeah. hand it out to like a water park or something. But they like <laughs> if they they're they're like pretty strict. They like give it to a ton of journalists and stuff. But like. They're very I, strict. They're known for yeah, the I, That's their whole I, brand. I, I, I was very psyched when it happened. Super, super psyched. I'm sure. Um, but I mean, I think having it for a while, it's like I'm more focused on the tweets and, you know, Got to put putting out, out good articles and, and things like that. And, you know, it's really cool. Like when I tell people about it uh, and I show them my Twitter, because like it's hard to explain like what I do to like someone I'm like. Cause, like it's my biggest hobby like if uh, someone's gonna ask me like what do you like to do in your free time it's like how can i just like ignore this and be like oh yeah like i like to write for the school newspaper like i like it doesn't even <laughs> you know, it doesn't even scratch the surface so it's like yeah i kind of i kind of yeah. write about baseball professionally in my free time and they're like what is that supposed to mean so then i like show them like my twitter and i'm like yeah so i write for this website and um i think that's kind of how i try and describe it or whatever gotcha so so you're you're now a uh, freshman going to be a sophomore in college at Dartmouth. What are you studying? I uh, I'm studying quantitative social science. Okay, so that's like a more like like a more like if I understand it correctly, it's more like it's like computer science, but more like applied to obviously quantitative or not like quite well to social science is it's, like I don't know how would you describe it. It, w it wouldn't even be like computer science. I, if you're familiar, I know you are, Jeremy, but if you're watching this and you're familiar with 538, I kind of describe it as the 538 major. Um, it's basically, I, I would say there's like two sort, there's two people who um, I think fit the bill for someone who'd be interested in this major. Either the math person who really wants to find applications and really wants to delve into those applications because numbers really do run the world and a lot of the most important decision makers you can't make any important decisions without having the information uh, and that's a, and with more and more data in the world like it's only become more and more saturated with numbers um or the person who's really interested in the social science but understands the quantitative component like you know it's one thing interesting to study political science and everything but so much of politics is number is numbers and um you know, I think understanding that also is really good um, for this major. So to kind of, I think that kind of gives it a, yeah. kind of a, a good scope. But generally, it's it's like a statistics major that also really does um, put an emphasis on the applications in whether it's government or economics or psychology or sociology or whatever. 
Gotcha. I know a lot of schools have like a specifically like applied statistics major. So it's kind of like that, but more specific to like what you're applying it to then? Kind of, but I wouldn't even, I, I don't know that I'd even call it applied statistics because we also, it also recognizes the importance of like computer programming. Like you have to take computer right. science one, which is a Python class. And it also recognizes the importance of, um, you know, advancing like pretty deep into a social science. Like you need to be getting into the weeds. You're, you know, you know, I think the, this is getting really, really too deep into it, but like in, at Dartmouth, in order to get like a minor, you need to take like seven classes in one subject. And for a QSS major, you can kind of choose whatever social science you want to focus on. You can even do multiple, but if let's say you choose one, you're almost getting an entire minor in that field within your major. And unfortunately they don't double count, so you don't get the minor anyway, but that's, that's besides the point. The point is, is it really has you delve into that one area or multiple areas of study, but it really has you take those higher level social science classes too. Um, and, and I don't know. I, I think it's it's kind of like applied statistics, but I feel like applied statistics isn't even doing it enough justice. Gotcha. So, so you did you pick your major because you wanted to work in baseball in the future, or is it because you're just more like interested in like the the field in general and don't want to limit yourself? You know, it's it's interesting. I think this this major is really unique to Dartmouth. There's not a lot of other programs like it. You know, I know you're doing data science, but that's more of the technical skills. Um, and I know there's like quantitative economics at other schools, but that's really focusing on economics. I think this is the most interdisciplinary, allows you to kind of pick a lot of your own path in a lot of ways. And it's a lot better than just the statistics major at a lot of other schools, because that is more theoretical without the necessary understanding of the social sciences, too. Um, but yeah, so this is like something that I'm interested in, but I'm interested in like data science and and uh, statistics beyond baseball too. Like I'm really interested in politics and really interested, um, you know, lesser known fact about me is that I'm really interested in meteorology and the weather, um, which also uses a lot of numbers. A young data. Mike Trout. Um, and so it's it's interesting because um, it, it's, it's interesting because Dartmouth really allows for the flexibility there. And so that's kind of what, drew me to this but i was i think it would set me up well for a career in baseball or a career in politics or really whatever i'd want to do it's very versatile which is another thing that i really like about it gotcha so i know this isn't really like totally relevant but you did bring it up and i know this about you and i wouldn't be asking someone like who i didn't know about this but we're going back to the meteorology thing you did a, a very interesting thing in high school with your with your snow days for your school do you want to talk about that for a little yeah so um when I was in high school, um, so like I'm from Northern Virginia, um, and Virginia doesn't really do a great job of being prepared um, for for snow, and um, it's kind of funny because, um, well, it's not really funny, but it's great for the for the kids who live in the school district because we get right. so many snow days for so little snow, and I know you, um, a, a Chicago native. Chicago suburbs native, you, you always used to scoff at how yeah, often like you're off of school. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, is like, yeah, I live in the northern part of the state, so we actually do get snow, uh, but the state just doesn't really budget. So um, I kind of took that to heart and tried to make snow day predictions for my friends. Um, and I built a, a built a pretty rough model where I went back through about three or four years. I looked at two different uh, characteristics. Number one, what our county did compared to the neighboring counties. So like if, the, if for example, like if we did the same thing as the, the county to the west of us, 75% of the time, and that county canceled school before we made a call, I'd feel very confident that our county would most likely follow because the weather isn't really that different across county lines. Um, and then I built it on, I, for my senior year, I built in a second component, um, which was, amount of snow forecasted versus hours out of school because I could also incorporate two hour delays. So I like, so I traded a full school school day of seven hours, a two hour delay is two hours, two hour early releases, two hours, even though those are quite rare. And then I regressed the number of inches of snow fall to the number of hours out of school. And the, and the R squared was like 0.9. It was actually really strong. Um, so, be, so like if the, you know, the meteorologist was calling for three inches, I'm like, okay, so if the, if there is three inches, you can project 6.3 hours out of school, which means they'll most likely cancel right. one day of school. 
um, you could you could feel pretty confident that that's what would happen. You could take the expected value and divide that by seven and go from there. Uh, but the problem with that is, you know, if it's over seven, then you're starting at like over 100 percent then you're into the next day off, whatever. Um, but, you know, that sort of stuff um, I felt was pretty cool. And, e- and even though there was one huge outlier that actually kept the trend, because when I was a freshman in high school, um, we got a storm of 29 inches and we wow. had. Yeah. So we had six consecutive snow days and a two hour delay on the back end. It was like a second winter break. Um, they canceled midterms at our high school and like never reinstituted them. So like there were there, like the, the the principal after that just decided midterms were uh, no longer necessary. So I, never I feel like that's almost like like that sounds so crazy. Like, oh, you got like six days off in a row, and now we're looking at it now like missing the last three months of school, and we're just like totally like, wow, that's nothing. Like it, if only, it's completely if only different. Only it's completely different. No, it is it's completely, completely different. different. This is this is this it's is what's worse. talking about snow days in like the the biggest school out. Well, not outage because we're still doing online school, but like in the biggest like. Yeah. I mean, it's not a snow day. I mean, but, like, it's home, very yeah, similar. It's, it's, I compa- it's, it's, I compared it to you when I was talking to you about it. It was like this seems like when we were waiting when some schools were when some colleges were canceling before others. I'm like this seems like a, just a massive snow day. Like, like they're not, obviously not canceling day. for tomorrow. They're canceling for the term. But like right. it seems exactly like right. That. It, it, especially because, like, you know, every college was canceling at different times, right? Harvard, I believe, was the first school to just be like, you know what, that's it, no, not coming back. And now it seems like every school inevitably has done that. I know Dartmouth did that, Purdue did that. Um, I don't actually know many people who still have the chance to go back to school at this point. So we're all just going to be home for months on end. So I'm um, going back to like your college and stuff. I know a lot of people ask me this question and I kind of struggle to find an answer. So I feel a little bad asking it to you because I know a lot of people ask me like, oh, like what's like the, the best way I can like the what's, what, what can I do as a high schooler or like a college student to get into the baseball industry? And like people ask me that question. I'm like, well, see, I don't work in the baseball industry right now. Like I have a Twitter account. I do some things with baseball, but I didn't do anything to like, like for a job application to get a job with a baseball team or like a network or whatever. So like, it's hard for me to answer, but I try and do the best I can to answer. Like what would, if someone asks, if someone watching this, a high schooler, say like a junior or senior in high school wants to work in a baseball front office, do stuff with numbers, what would you say to them? Like as advice? Well, I mean, at first I would say that I'm not in the baseball industry. Right. I mean, yes, I, I write about it, but I, I would, I think it depends on the definition of your base of baseball industry. Like if you work, if you, if I was a full-time writer at Fangraphs, like if this was my full-time gig, maybe I would have an answer, a different question, but my full-time job is being a student. So I'm not in the baseball industry. I'm leaving it at that. But um, I, I think the what has helped me at least like get a bigger platform has always been my writing first and foremost. My, you know, I started a blog and I did that. I mean, I, before I even got an actual paying baseball writing job at all, I had been blogging for four years, like on my own. I was very dedicated. I wrote a lot. Um, I tried to write every single day. Um, and I, I don't really know what sort of drive was within me to, to keep myself doing this for four years. I think it was because I was gaining a following on Twitter and pe- and I felt like people actually relied on me um, for my opinions, which may be a little bit of a stretch, but that's kind of how I thought, and that's you know what drove me. So I would say it, it takes a really long time. I mean, a lot of people ask me similar questions, like you're writing for Fangraphs, you're a college freshman, like like how long, like how did how did this happen? It's like, I mean, I've I've when you like put it in context, I started writing about baseball in 2012. November of this year will be eight years. Like I, I've just been doing it for a long time. And, and I just happened to get lucky and start when I was really young and really find a passion. Um, so, yeah, I would say if you're a junior or a senior, um, sure, start a blog, but also just know that, like, it may be literal years before you're writing anywhere else or doing something else other than writing for the blog. And even still, it's like I'm not in the baseball industry, and I also understand how competitive these jobs are. Um, you know, you need to stay open minded and understand that, like, you know, you, you need to pick something that will be versatile. Like if I don't go into baseball when I graduate, I'm probably going to end up doing political data science, um, maybe journalism. I, I don't really know. Um, or maybe grad school. But like I, I'm not 
you know, set on this, like definitely going to be working in baseball sort of thing, because I think you have to understand how many people out there really actually want to do this too. Right. I think that definitely does set you apart from a lot of other people on like baseball Twitter. I know a lot of people that would follow us, like don't really like think that much about like what, like what happened before, like a year ago. But I think that you're starting writing like eight years ago, like you said, it's like not a lot of people started doing anything that they would end up doing eight years later that like that early in life, like not even just with baseball, but obviously baseball in your case. But I guess to, to, to follow that up, you go to Dartmouth, which is notable. Like it's a, it's a very smart school. It's in, it's in the Ivy league and it's known for its like every other Ivy league school. It's known for it's, it's like coursework. And you still manage to write uh, articles for fan graphs relatively consistently. How do you like balance baseball and the Dartmouth um, coursework and like your social life? Because they do have a social life at like Ivy League schools, contrary to what some people would, might might believe. Like you do, you do still hang out with friends and stuff. So I don't know yes, how yes. there are only twenty four hours in the day. You got to sleep. How do you balance all of this out? Um. I would say a lot of it is being efficient and also knowing where your priorities are. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, kick myself if I don't get um, a fan graphs article in for a week. And I think also it's like I'm very thankful that uh, Megan David, Meg, the managing editor of fan graphs, and David, the the owner of fan graphs, they're they're so understanding that like school comes first, and like they know that when I'm you know on summer vacation, I'll be writing multiple times a week. Because I get bored and want to find things to do. Um, right. So during the school year, like fan graphs, you know, as much as you might not think, it's actually kind of low on my priority um, rankings because school comes first and I have a job at the Dartmouth newspaper as well. And, you know, they can't, they literally cannot print the paper unless my story is in on time. And so, right. you know, you have to understand that. And I really enjoy doing that. Um, and, and all my other activities too. So it's all about prioritizing. It's all about staying on top of your work. Um, you know, first and foremost, like I'm not going to write a fangrass article unless I actually have the time to do so. I'm not going to put off school work to go do that. Um, and, you know, it's very, I'm very grateful that I have two understanding bosses of my situation. Um, and then really, I think that's what makes it work. Um, and, you know, it, I post a lot on Twitter and I'll, I'll like, Honestly, that's usually when I'm like taking study breaks and whatnot. And um, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of how I make it all work. Cool. So um, before college, when you probably had a little bit more time on your hands, like what did you do with that time outside of baseball? Like what were your other hobbies? Did you play baseball like at all growing up? I'm sure you did a little bit because yeah, yeah. you're very interested in baseball. Yeah, I mean, I, I played baseball um, from when I was like five through when I was like, you know, last season. So when I threw it, I was 18, fall and spring. Um, I mean, I think as I got older, especially as I got near the end of my high school, playing baseball also kind of moved down my priority list. Um, I, you know, did internships during the summer. Um, I, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill for a summer. I got really, really interested in journalism just in general. Um, so for a couple of years in high school, um, my junior year, I ran the print edition of our newspaper. And then my senior year, I ran the website. Um, so that I was very involved with that. I debated in high school um, and really enjoyed being on the debate team. Um, so, I mean, I kept myself busy. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, I, know, I like how you say I had more time on my hands. I don't necessarily like think when I was a junior in high school, I had so much time on my that hands. Is just junior of high school. Um, junior year of high school. Is, but no, senior year, like by the, especially by the end of the senior, senior year, it was really like, a lot of time to write but um but yeah i mean it it's uh you know it's all it's I mean, even then it's all about prioritizing um knowing what's important it's like you know if for me it was like if i had to skip a baseball game to study for a test i had to skip a baseball game to study for a test i mean you, you just kind of have to understand what's important and for me what was important was doing well in school and, and going to a, a good college and you know because even if i do want to work in baseball all, all those things still apply Right. You, right. All those things you still need to do well in school. You still need to, you know, I mean, go to college, of course, and then, you know, progress from there. And and you just kind of had to understand that, put things in perspective. And I kind of knew pretty early on that I wasn't going to be playing professional baseball. So that might also have been yeah. the reason why I started this blog. It's like I was never like a phenomenal baseball player. I was good, 
especially like when I played, you know, in the majors and little league when I was like 12 and practiced all the time. And I, it was a very big time commitment for me. And I actually got pretty decent, you know, as they say, like practice makes better. Um, so yeah, I was, I was decent then, but as it moved down the priority list, it was just like, you know, I'm going to do these other things. Gotcha. So you did say that you, you would probably be working in like politics or journalism if you weren't interested in baseball, but like, or obviously not in like the career stage of our life yet. So like, where do you think you'd be right now if you just decided, like, if you did not decide eight years ago to like start baseball stuff? No, I, I, I struggle thinking about this. Too. It's, it's hard. It's hard for me to answer that question, but I, it's, it's cause I, I do have like a lot of varied interests. Yeah. I mean, baseball is my, my number one interest by, by far. Um, I, I don't necessarily know that my like life path would look significantly different. Like, I don't know that I picked Dartmouth just for a career in baseball. Like right. the, the QSS degree that I'm going to be doing, it's, it's very applicable. I may still have decided that, um, that like, this was a good fit for me regardless. I, you know, it's interesting because I don't know that I would have understood the value of data in, in statistics as much without the sports driving it because in very few fields is there so much publicly available quantifiable data like so much data is is private and proprietary but in sports in baseball in particular so much of it is public and the, you know that really gets you interesting you know interested in like what is what else is out there what could be private um but i i guess that really gets off track i, I think it's hard for me to answer this one but i think like I'd, i'm still probably be pretty interested in politics uh, i think i'd be pretty much very set on doing that with my career I think at this point uh, but I don't really know because I, I I think a lot of my interests in data and numbers does come from baseball gotcha my so, for, it, for that yeah so a couple like quicker questions like not like super in-depth like what are some of your favorite classes you've taken like in recent years or even going further back if you had like a an elementary school class that you liked a lot um yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, at first, I had some great elementary school teachers, um, you know. That, that shout out to the elementary Yeah, shout out, shout out to them. Wouldn't be um, here without you guys. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think we're, we're thinking about, like, advice. I think a couple of interesting classes that I've taken. Um, one, I took AP Statistics my senior year. That was a great class. Uh, took AP U.S. History my junior year. Also, just shout out um, – great class um learned a lot um, and i'm really interested in american history and obviously there's a lot of politics tied into history um and then uh, in college so far i've taken some interesting classes i took so like we have this writing requirement that we have to fulfill um as a freshman to make sure everyone's kind of up to speed on what the college writing um progression and how to write a research paper so my topic was on um the history and theory behind media, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and I also took a class that uh, used a lot of R, um, the intro class for the QSS major, which was like a, an, a kind of like AP statistics, but much more difficult because it was calculus based and there was a lot of R programming. Like all of our homework assignments had to be turned in using R notebooks and things like that. So you got a lot of R experience, um, which obviously makes things difficult when you're trying to do statistics and learn a programming language at the same time. Um, so yeah, those four, um, definitely some of my favorite classes I've taken at least in the last three years. Cool. And then the last question I'll ask you is, um, what's your favorite like sports memory, like of your life? Like either something you've like attended in person or something you remember watching from home? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll answer both. Um, and attended in person, I think, you know, it's really, it's really interesting because there's some canned answers, but then there's also like these crazy, like, you know, when you go to a playoff game, those already, the stakes are much higher. Those can be great. But I, one of the games that I think I will never, ever forget was a Capitals game um, versus the San Jose Sharks, regular season game. really didn't mean anything. Um, Alex Ovechkin had a hat trick. Um, a guy on the Sharks had a hat trick. So there were two hat tricks. It was a 7-6 final, went to overtime. Probably one of the craziest games I think I've ever seen in any sport. It was actually the first time and only time in Cavs franchise history that Ovechkin had a hat trick and they lost. Uh, but to just be able to say that you've seen Ovechkin do what he's known for, you know, not only score goals, but get a hat trick. I think that was just like so cool. 
Um, and, and I think that was probably one of the coolest sports memories. And like, yeah, the Cavs lost, but like, am I ever in as for like the stakes of the game being just like a regular season game and like what the outcome was, I think there was a huge like reward versus what you were expecting. Right. Like you get, you know, you go, you go to like Definitely. playoff games and you already know that like, Oh, the stakes are higher. This is going to be a memory forever. But for like a regular game, it's like, wow, like that was insane. Um, and then on T you like group in on TV, um, Roy Halladay's perfect game. I actually read about this in Fangraphs last week when they did staff picks on favorite games to rewatch while we're all um, stuck at home, um, which stay at home, please, please stay at home. Like, you know, I'll do, I will do um, my best to just tell you all, please stay at home for the <laughs> safety of everyone else. Um, so yeah, so while we're all st- stuck at home, Fangraphs has been a piece. It's like favorite games to rewatch. Um, so I picked that one. And it really does have a personal connection with me because, um, you know, I, my grandfather and, and grandmother, they're from Philly. And um, my grandfather, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, um, he and I were really close. He got me into baseball. The Phillies won the World Series when I was seven years old. And so that was really the first time I started getting into baseball. And then the Phillies continued their run um, of winning the division all through 2011. And obviously, I got more and more interested. I remember in 2009, I watched like every single game on MLB game day because like I'm out of market. So like I didn't get any of the games, but I would just watch the pitch come in. And and I remember like I remember like, for example, like this isn't the game, but and I know I'm going off on a tangent, but I remember when Eric Brutlett had the unassisted triple play against the Mets. I think that was in 2009 or 2010. The MLB game day like didn't know what to do. Like it was like seven five. There was runners on like first and second, nobody out, and then it just said final. And I'm like, what happened? What happened? That's um, funny. And, and and then I like <laughs> later on ESPN, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was insane. Yeah. Uh, but but anyway, the game, um, Roy Halladay threw his perfect game May 29th of 2010. And it, it very um, the story with that is I actually wore Halliday's jersey every single day he started that year. So I was wearing his jersey. Um, and we were actually out. It was a couple days past my brother's birthday, so we had some family in town. We were in some furniture store, like a, a, in a shopping center, and the guy's like, "Oh yeah, you you a Phillies fan? That, uh, that's a nice Holiday jersey." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know I am. Like, love Holiday. Like he's my favorite player. He'll always be my favorite baseball player." And then that night, he goes out and throws a perfect game. And my dad, my, I remember my dad was like, "Yeah, so you know you can go to bed when he gives up a hit, and like he never <laughs> gave up a hit." And it was I just I watched every single. Um, because by that point, so yeah, so that kind of ties in because by that point I got MLB extra innings for my birthday present um, for my ninth birthday. And that was a great birthday present so I could watch every Phillies game like on TV. So I watched that entire game and like, I just, it was probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. That's and I know cool. you've seen a perfect game in person. Yeah, I was at so, Mark in 2009. They were just showing it on TV. It was pretty fun to watch. I didn't watch it in full uh, since I was there, but. I don't remember any of it, really. I mean, I remember being there. I remember in the parking lot on the way out, but I don't remember much of the game at all. It was the first game I did, like, I kept score at, which is cool. So I have, like, the scorecard I got assigned by him. So that's pretty different. easy. Perfect games are crazy. I keep score. Pretty yeah, easy. Yeah, it was just, like, a, just a bunch of threes in a row. And, like, yeah, was, like, when I have to keep ball. score, and then, like, a bunch of guys, like, you know, get on base and, like, they bat around and you got to, like, start filling in yeah, what the guy did the second back. time. Like, it's, like, it's open. annoying. It's, like, yeah, so you got to go over the second inning and then, like, make sure you mark that it's, like, actually the first inning. It's, like... Right, and then, like, the next inning, you got to, like, cross out all the innings and say, actually, like, this is, like, the inning out. Like, it's right, yeah, so it must... Way. It was, they need a better way. It was, very, it was very easy for you to keep score at that game, considering it was just nicely, you know, 3-3-3, three, 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 you know? Out, right, out, out. and out the Sox had, like, one beginning, but it wasn't even, like, a batting around thing. Whatever your definition of batting around, I don't even think they did it. They hit a grand slam, and that was four of their five runs. But, yeah, I feel like... For something that happens so often, like batting around, I feel like they really need to make it easier to do on the scorecard. I know they give you like an extra tenth inning there, but like for something that happens, I don't know. Yeah, how what, what, yeah what I normally do is like, if it, let's say it happens in the first inning, if like the leadoff hitter comes up in the uh, first inning for a second time, I just write first in the upper left hand corner, just so I know that that happened in the first inning, and then gotcha. for second for whoever started the second inning, and then just go from there. That's my way of doing it. I think uh, when you keep score for a long time, it's really funny because my grandfather was the one who taught me how to keep score. Okay. Um, at one of the one of the Phillies games he took me to when I was a kid, or uh, younger, I guess I'm still kind of a kid. But um, but uh, yeah, so it's like everyone kind of keeps score in their own in their own way, which I think is really cool. For sure. And like everyone knows their own system. 
Yeah. Well, Devin, I really appreciate you being the uh, the first um, interviewee on this uh, series. Hopefully it turns into something really cool. And like whenever you go to the the YouTube playlist, you're always the first one to pop up on like the the very successful series. But I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, no, thank, thank you. For you. On. And thanks for having me. And I know you'll have plenty of time to be doing these interviews, even with online I've got so school. many lined up. I'm so excited to. That's to start good. That should be awesome. That should be awesome. I'll be on the 